Hello everybody, I'm Jim Lee from uh, Sumter, South Carolina. I'm a diligent researcher and I, I publish all of my research on climateviewer.com and I create apps for activists on climateviewer.org. I want to thank Mr. Griffin for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Thank you, sir. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak and uh, thank my wife for all the support over the last five years. It would not be possible without that. Okay, so um, uh, geoengineering, weather modification, and weaponizing nature. Now, this is a topic that is very personal to me. Um, I was a Boy Scout, and I've observed nature most of my life, and I was completely unaware that people modify the weather. Um, in addition, I did about a year worth of research, uh, weather studies and ROTC, and this never came up, so that was kind of shocking. Um, so much for the uh, education system. So a global warming alarmist will tell you that all the extreme weather events that we're seeing today have something to do with the CO2, and we all know that that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, in fact, I'm going to be putting up a website pretty soon, weathermodificationhistory.com. I suggest you all check it out. But um, James Corbett put out a great video the other day on this topic, and I hope that you will all check it out. I don't want to get too deep into that. I want to talk specifically about the history, the 100-year history of people modifying the weather. Um, this is something that's not taught in public um, education at all, and I think that that should change. Because in 1978, there was a UN law signed called NMOD that bans weather warfare. Now, that took me by surprise. I was two years old when they banned weather warfare, and I had to figure out why. So let's do that history. 100 years ago, there was a guy named Charles Mallory Hadfield. He was known as the moisture accelerator. He uh, mixed chemicals in vats and he burned them to make rain. Back then it was called rain making or pluviculture. Now, he was contracted by the city of San Diego to make it rain. They told him they'd pay him $10,000 to do it, and he did it. The problem is he did $3.5 million worth of flooding damage, and unless he assumed liability for all of that, he never got paid. That's the Lake Morena Dam falling apart right there. Um, then we go to the birth of cloud seeding. This is really the official start of the modern era of weather modification. Vincent Schaefer, Irving Langmire, and Bernard Vonnegut. Um, on the left there, you can see uh, Vincent Schaefer, and on the right, you can see Vincent Schaefer breathing in a freezer. That is how cloud seeding was invented. You cannot make that up. So less than a year later, Less than a year later, they tried to steer a hurricane with it. Project Cirrus was the, the, those three scientists you just saw were from General Electric. They got with the U.S. Army Navy Weather Bureau, and they went out and seeded a, a tropical storm, which then turned into a hurricane, which changed colors, 120-degree de turn, slammed into Savannah, killing one and doing $3 million worth of damage. Do you think that stopped them? No. In 1949, Irving P. Crick invented the ground-based cloud seeder. And for, for those who've never heard of cloud seeding, the idea is really simple. You put a little particle in the air, um, water attaches to it, and hopefully it falls on the ground. Those are seeds or aerosols. So they put seeds into the clouds to try to make it rain. This guy does it from the ground. Now, um, this is a map from 52 of 65 of all of the different uh, cloud seeding projects. Uh, 1958, did you know that in Palm Springs, planes were clouding the sky and blocking out the sun? Today we call this chemtrails euphemistically online is the general term that they like to call it, but in 1958, they said that an exuberant mob of sky riders were blocking out the sun. The, the Air Force so far is flabbergasted. The Navy wasn't, however, when they were dropping carbon black dust suspended in liquid creating clouds. Now, our previous speaker spoke about soot. That's the other term for carbon black dust. So they were putting carbon black dust in the sky, making clouds and destroying them with a dry version. They had preventing forest fires and cloud seeding with Project Skyfire. And Project Skywater quickly expanded the, globe, the, the United States uh, federal involvement in weather modification, you could see contractors, experimental, pilot projects, and Bureau of Reclamation, everybody's favorite. Now they modify the weather, so the, the military also started modifying space. Now, they don't like the ionosphere because it's unpredictable. 
And unpredictable is not cool for operations, so why don't we create an artificial ionosphere by putting 480 million needles in space? Most, some of them are still up there, the rest are in the North Pole and the ice. NOAA then had Project Storm Fury where they did more cloud seeding experiments on hurricanes. NOAA swore they would never do it again after this. In 1963, they started plasma seeding. And I like to call it plasma seeding because it's similar to cloud seeding. It's just done in space. They call that space weather modification. Um, they banned upper atmospheric nuclear explosions because the military was trying to destroy the ionosphere, which they failed, thankfully. And uh, so they had to come up with a better way to uh, engineer a mousetrap, so they started using sounding rockets and creating artificial ion clouds in space. These ion clouds are made of barium and strontium. Now, this is something that's usually attributed to chemtrails, and that's because people don't know the 60-year history of dumping barium and strontium in space. The reason they do this, the ionosphere is invisible. You need a tracer element to see it. So they dump chemicals up there, they heat them with microwaves, and they can see it. They can also modify it. The solar-powered satellite was uh, an idea they had in 1968 where they said, as long as the program was called solar energy by the United States, it couldn't be called a weapons project. I will be releasing this online so you guys can get a copy of this entire presentation with references. Um, commercial airlines to end, quote, smoke pollution of the skies, 1970. History repeats itself, and those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. In 58, they blocked the sun out. There was so much air traffic that the state of Illinois and New Jersey sued the airline industry for chemtrails in 1970. Secretary of Transportation Bolt stood in and he said, let's get this thing figured out. 43 air carriers met with him and they agreed to install burner cans to reduce 70% of the particulates coming out of planes and chemtrails went away for quite a long time. Now, we're at the point where 30 years after the invention of cloud seeding, it is used as a weapon in war. Operation Popeye, make mud not war. And basically, the 54th Weather Reconnaissance Squadron used three planes to modify the weather over Vietnam for you know, five years. Here's a picture of the US Navy's China Lake cold cloud modification system. That's a weather modification bomb. Um, and over there on the side, you can see the goals of Operation Popeye, a.k.a. Operation Motor Pool. We would not know about any of this if it weren't for real journalists and people who actually care. Hero Jack Anderson over there saw a secret memo sitting on Lyndon Johnson's desk that said, continue Operation Popeye plus weather modification over Laos. If he hadn't seen that note, and if uh, Senator Pell had not held secret hearings, this would not be public today. What, 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 and then let's get to what happened as a result of this secret meetings. They were held January 20th, uh, 25th, 20th, and 26th. I have uh, transcripts for the first two. The third one, the 26th, is still classified to this day. Please FOIA that. Um, but under, uh, under uh, oath, they lied and lied and lied. We have not, as Secretary Laird previously said, ever engaged in weather modifications on, in northern Vietnam. Lie, lie, lie. Regardless, two laws were passed to finally get some transparency in the world of weather modification. The Reporting Act of 72 and the Policy Act of 1976. These uh, required you to fill out these two forms. This is your initial report, and you basically say, I want to modify the weather. On, on this uh, slide right here, they actually have a little checkbox that says, what kind of material are you using? Silver iodide, urea. That's fertilizer, I didn't know you could even do that. CO2, they, they do dry ice cloud seeding, so they don't mind dumping CO2 to modify the weather, uh, but that's a story for another day. So um, NMID was signed in 78, that was the last step of this, um, and you could see who signed it there and who didn't really care. And uh, they agreed to not use the weather for hostile purposes. So this law only, um, only applies to intent. I didn't mean to hurt anybody. Um, and similarly, the, the US Congress was like, wait, we're, what, we're banning weather warfare? I didn't know we could modify the weather, which I'm sure a lot of you are feeling in this room right now. So the congressmen were like, I need to know what's going on. There was a 784-page document that summed up all of the activities in America up to this point. 
Um, and then the next year they, they broke it down by hours and you can see that the airborne uh, operations total about 3,000 hours. But the ground-based cloud seeder that Ir Irving P. Crick invented, well over 30,000 hours operational in one year. Right now in uh, uh, the Rocky Mountains, they are operational from October to March of every year. So NMOD has no teeth, it's just an agreement, it's a sheet of paper people signed. Um, it, there's no way to detect weather warfare and no way to prove your case or enforcement. That's kind of stupid. So where are we today? We are now in what's called the blue gold rush. Fresh water has been dubbed blue gold in many publications as potable water will be to this century what oil was to the last century. Cloud seeding is now big business. You can see right there, countries are spending millions to control the weather. Here's why. Um, that article went viral way too fast, and they quickly renamed it to China is spending millions on uh, modifying the weather for the Olympics because the other article title was way too accurate. And in the bottom corner there, you can see that you can pay Oliver Travel's company, 100,000, I believe that's euros, um, to get rid of the clouds on your wedding day. So weather modification is so common now, even travel companies are doing it. This is my app, Climate Viewer 3D. It's at climateviewer.org 3D. And you can see all of the global weather modification projects. I mapped them myself. On the sidebar there, you can see towards the bottom, those are the NOAA reports from the government. They do not publish them. I had to call NOAA to get them. So they are still using that law, those sheets, but they, uh, they all went bad in uh, 2008, and I have not seen a copy of this report since. So apparently, uh, in order to further this global warming extreme weather event, um, they, they, you know, they're now just going to let everybody modify the weather without reporting at all for the last five years. Um, Homeland Security is now doing hur hurricane control. You can't make this stuff up. As a result of Hurricane Katrina, they believe that it's a national security concern. Um, so they had the hurricane work workshop in uh, Boulder, Colorado in 2008, and they talked about using soot to steer hurricanes again. Mosh Alamaro from the MIT uh, proposed that. There's a whole bunch of different ones, but regardless, Sec um, Secretary Jay Cohen uh, mod uh, made all this possible, and he said, let's modify the track speed, winds and rains of hurricanes, um, and here are all of their faces a couple geoengineering scientists uh, who think they know how to modify the weather. Geoengineering and uh, weather modification have really gotten twisted up. So the U.S. military is now in, uh, violating NMOD. We have two FOIAs, um, one from the Navy, one from the Air Force. These were published on the sunshineproject.org. That website was deleted from the internet, but I'm a very nosy person. So I got these back from archive.org, and they're now published on climateviewer.com. Um, you can see the title of that is Weather Modification Using Carbon Black. Soot. It's been mentioned several times here today. Oh, and that's the U.S. Air Force Phillips Lab. On the other side, we got the U.S. Navy. And guess what they call it? Non-lethal warfare. Um, so now if you want to know who's modifying the weather, it's called the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Directorate. You can FOIA that. So U.S. military, they had this thing called the owning the weather in 2025. Now the debunkers and the arguers online will say this was just a think piece, people hanging out at the Air Force College talking about what we should do in the future. They say right there, CBD, carbon black dust, in 2005, and it says technologies to be developed by the DOD. Now that would be great if it was just a think piece, but um, Dr. Uh, Philip Barnes uh, met with the U.S. Army and Air Force in a joint weather test technology symposium 97 where they said weather modification using carbon black. And they said that they would do it for all the same reasons they did during Operation Popeye. History is now repeating itself. Cloud ionizers. Now, nobody knows about this. It's, as far as I know, it's the only place it's even mentioned on the Internet is on my website. And I've been telling everybody about it for three years, so one day they'll talk about it. Um, there's th four different systems pictured here. Mateo Systems WeatherTech, AST Clear Sky Manager, Ionogenics ELAT System, Australian Re Rain Technologies, Atlant Cloud Ionizer. These are using electricity for the cloud seeds. They're putting ions into the sky. It's the same thing that your air filter does. It attracts um, particulates together. They condense and form rain. So in fact, this would actually remove pollution as opposed to putting toxic chemicals up there to modify the weather. I think that's pretty cool. Um, 
To take it a step further, Acquiesce and Cy Blue paired up and got a, a permit to modify the weather in Texas. You can read the permit on my website. And uh, they said that they were going to steer oceanic atmospheric rivers. These are also called tropospheric rivers. These are rivers in the sky. So what they realize is that they've been just generally cloud seeding on every cloud that comes by, but in reality, if there's not enough water, cloud seeding will actually shut off precipitation. If you can steer a river in the sky, you can bring all the water you want. Coincidentally, I've been talking about rivers in the sky for three years, and one came and visited my house October of last year. They called it the thousand year flood in South Carolina. I got 33 inches of rain in one day. That's a coincidence, I'm sure. So this so enraged the World Meteorological Expert Team on Weather Modification. Yes, they have a thing called the Expert Team on Weather Modification. And they said, weather modification technologies claim to achieve such a large scale or dramatic effects do not have sound scientific basis, e.g. hail cannons and ionization methods, and should be treated with suspicion. I would add to that and say that geoengineering should be treated with suspicion. So, this is where it really gets weird. Secretary of Defense William Cohen said others are engaging in even an ecotype of terrorism whereby they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes, volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. That's crazy. Not so crazy. Ionospheric heaters are the newest thing for modifying space. They no longer just use the sounding rockets and tiny radars, they use very focused, very high-powered microwave antennas to modify space weather. High Pass, the one in the top corner, has actually been torn down. It was the predecessor to HARP, and before that it was Sipel Station. I don't mention it here. But HARP is the big daddy today. The other three there are kind of cool, but they're, they're second best for the moment. Now, up there in the top corner, Arecibo, you guys have probably seen that in the 007 movie, the big dome when they're having the fight on the catwalk. Well, they put some antennas down in the bottom of it now in what they call a cast grain antenna, which is like a chain link fence, and they suspended it over top of it and have now re-engaged the ionospheric heater at Arecibo. And Sura's over in Russia, Tromso's over in Norway. Tromso's getting a big upgrade to 100 gigawatts, so it will surpass uh, HARP as the most powerful on the planet very soon. So HARP is up in Gakona, Alaska. Now this guy gets picked on so much by so many people on the internet that I can very rarely have a serious conversation with anybody about it. So what I want to do is talk about what it really does. It was designed to suck radiation out of the sky, period. At the tether panel, um, Dennis Papadopoulos from the University of Maryland proposed funding for uh, HARP because he wanted to create a wind tunnel or a test chamber for creating a mitigation system for electromagnetic pulse, high altitude electromagnetic pulse. What does that mean? Everybody talks about Iran getting a nuke, which is, once again, double speak. Iran already has an EMP weapon. China has an EMP weapon, North Korea has an EMP weapon, so does Russia. If they dropped an EMP over America, the Heritage Foundation said two-thirds of Americans would die in six months. The TV show Revolution is about that. So this is a backup system to suck radiation out of the sky. Similarly, a Carrington event, which is a large solar flare, would kill us today, big time. This may be the only thing that could stop that. So I want to hate it but it may save your life one day. The problem with that, Jacob Bortnick says, we want to get rid of the Van Allen belts. I don't even see why we have them. So you've got these sick guys modifying the ionosphere. They use it for all kinds of things. The big one, though, that gets the most arguing online is called elf waves. And elf waves can entrain in your brain and affect your brain. The Russian Duma said that we are creating a mind control weapon. And they create a virtual antenna in the sky by pumping electricity into something called the electrojet. This is called polar electrojet heating. The electrojet is that circle right there above the North Pole. That's why Tromso and all of these other um, ionospheric heaters are near the North Pole. The really cool thing for them, though, is they figured out a different way to do it. Now they call it ionospheric current drive. And what they're actually doing is heating a higher part of the ionosphere, which is making a signal that's heating the lower part of the ionosphere, which is then making an antenna that makes elf waves that talk to submarines and drive you crazy. 
The thing is, it can be implemented anywhere, anytime. So now they don't need HARP. So everybody wanted to talk online about how HARP was sold or destroyed, and that doesn't make any sense. They sold it to the, to the University of Alaska because they're going to put them on boats. Makes sense to me. Why would they want me to map out all their ionospheric heaters on my Climate Viewer 3D when they can hide them on boats that move around all the time? I can't put a dot on a map on something that's constantly moving around. Um, and they call it the straw man, <laughs> high frequency array, straw man. That's cute. Um, so these barges, they say that we could put one right about here. These little green strip across the equator and the other one, optimal region for an alpha ray happens to be right on the spot where that 8.0 hit New Zealand the other day because elf waves can create earthquakes. We're gonna leave that for another day. Finally, Project Lucy, um, they talking about creating noctilucent clouds from using two transmitters like ARP to compress atmospheric methane into diamond dust. And you can actually hear Dave and Keith at the SRM 2015 conference saying, we're gonna use diamond dust to cool the planet. I'm not making this stuff up. Malcolm Light from the, yeah, from the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. And if you guys haven't heard of AMEG yet, you need to look up the clathrate gun hypothesis and all their stuff they talk about with methane doom. These guys wrote a letter to world leaders asking for geoengineering in 2013, saying that by 2015, they could mount them on submarines, planes, and drilling rigs when the ice has melted. <laughs> We've all heard that. <laughs> so I'm just saying don't cross the streams. That's probably a bad idea. So that brings us to the topic of the day, geoengineering. Now, I did all that history because I'm pretty sure none of you have heard this stuff. And I, I'm a very meticulous researcher. I pride myself on being accurate. and something I could take in a court of law and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now this solar radiation management looks like this little animation here. You put particles in the sky and the sun blocks, bounces off of it. So they want to block the sun to save us from global warming. So what you guys are doing here is very important to me. Because if not, this is what we're going to get. And I've got some of the terminology up there. Marine cloud brightening thermal radiation management, shortwave climate engineering, the list goes on. Now, censorship and the ability for people to find out this information is impeded by the use of control, the, the control of the words that they use to describe these things. So I did a little Google Scholar uh, search to see what all the nerds were saying about it, and it turns out I was pretty right. Geoengineering weather modification happened to be the most popular. That's what we're going to call it today. But there are many other different terms. Climate engineering is more accurate. That stuck for a little while, and then they called it climate intervention when the CIA stepped in and renamed it that. This all came about from Edward Teller, Lowell Wood, and Roderick Hyde. Edward Teller invented the hydrogen bomb. This was, this was all designed at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. So this guy, he invented the hydrogen bomb, hydrogen bomb as a weapon to never be used. It was so scary it should never be used. And I would argue that geoengineering is the same. Clean up your act or we're going to use this incredible weapon of doom on you. So he pushed it. Ken Caldera, in the second paper there, he made a computer model of the future, of what geoengineering would do to the planet. And he said, this looks rosy. We cooled the planet really well. So then they wrote a follow-up paper, and then a Nobel laureate came along and said, hey, let's do it with sulfuric acid. That'll work. And the, the push has been on ever since. And here's everybody's favorite fun guy, Bill Gates. And he has something called the Fund for Innovative Climate and Energy Research, Pfizer, where he uh, hands out money to Ken Caldera and David Keith, and all the scientific Illuminati come over and beg for money from them. That's why we get all this geoengineering studies. Chart on the left-hand side shows who's paying for it. National Science Foundation is the biggest culprit. You can see the Pfizer right above that smaller dot, European Commission, NERC. These are the people paying to block your sunlight in the future, in the future. On the right-hand side, you can see SRM authors. Those are the guys pictured at the top, are the biggest uh, culprits. I'm calling them lobbyists because they are not researchers. They're not just advocating the study of this. They, want, they are advocating this become a reality. So Stephen Salter and John Latham have this thing called the Silver Lining Project. It's marine cloud brightening. They deleted their Silver Lining Project website. Of course, I found that too. So I call it the Silver Lining Project just because they don't like it called that. 
Um, but their idea is to take sea salt and spray it into clouds to make them whiter and brighter, which will reflect more sunlight. They, want, uh, they proposed a couple thousand drone boats in the Pacific Ocean to do it. Those are robots. Bill Gates himself and patent troll Nathan Mervhold got together to uh, their intellectual ventures company to create the StratoShield hose to the sky. And they literally roll it out of a, a building, a, a, a blimp flies it up into space, and they pump the sulfuric acid, titanium dioxide, aluminum oxide directly into the stratosphere. No planes required. Over in the UK, they had the SPICE project. Um, they proposed an actual test of this. They were going to drag a blimp behind a boat and spray some chemicals, see how much sunlight they could block. Um, the et cetera group, Jim Thomas, a friend of mine, um, a, well, a colleague, uh, they put a, a stink out in the, the papers and made this go away. So this, this project never actually happened. Four years later, they put the website back up. They're pushing for another experiment. Hopefully, they'll forget about it and not come this time. Um, and it, <laughs> the Asilomar conference, these, this is a 2010 meeting where uh, they, they had all of the geoengineering scientists get together and they said, quote, as for the U.S. Department of Defense, forget about it to this group. The involvement of the military is pretty freaky. The other quote they said that is, <laughs> that's missing from there, and I'll just do it from memory, if the, uh, if the, the, the globe starts to see this as a, quote, um, a rich, uh, an idea cooked up by rich Anglo-Saxons to dominate the climate, then we will all be tarred and feathered. I debated Ken Calder and David Keith for three years in his forum that's online, and I finally had enough of him talking about reframing questions to get the answers that he liked, that I told him, Ken, I'm going to be there with the tar and feathers. He, he banned me from his forum the day after, and Andrew Lockie had a little cry fest with him. But the problem with this is geoengineering SRM will kill people. And this is why it has not been legalized up to this point. Whether it's going on or not is a topic for later discussion we're going to get to. But this is the real problem, is that they know it will change rainfall patterns worldwide. And they've got all the charts to prove it. And the natural analog for that is that when volcanoes go off, the, the Amazon basin can dry up almost completely. And if people in the southern hemisphere are robbed of water permanently as a result of geoengineering schemes, they need to know how to pay the dead people. That's why this is very serious. So the COP20, or uh, excuse me, the Convention for Biological Diversity got together in 2012 and banned geoengineering tests or experimentation until blah, blah, blah. Problem is, the U.S. was not a party to this accord. The U.S. does not care about this ban. So this is where we all come you know, full circle to what we're dealing with here today, COP21. They, uh, they said that you know, we, we really should wait till after the Paris Agreement to get funding for geoengineering because we don't want to see as being biased. And there was a DC leaks email um, from Hillary Clinton's uh, team where John Podesta has created this group who are basically breaking down how they're going to make it a reality. So Podesta and Hillary aren't going away whether you like it or not. Um, and they're trying to make geoengineering a reality. In fact, um, we're already living in a geoengineered world. This is the UN Secretary General saying that we're already living in a massive experiment. Why should we go into another one? So what does he mean by that? He's talking about artificial cloud creation. Ship tracks are something that most people don't know about, they don't think about it, but it's a geoengineering program, except it's just pollution, except it's accidental, it's inadvertent, and you know they call it accidental or inadvertent weather modification at the conferences they have, because it's just pollution. It is modifying the weather, but you know, we got to move boats. These boats are so bad, in fact, that they create more pollution than all of the cars in the world. There's 16 boats. You know, when they're taking away my, uh, people's ability to burn firewood in Oregon because of CO2, I say sink those 16 boats and let's call it even. And, and, and the reason for that is it's this, this stuff called bunker fuel. You should look it up, but basically it's very, very dirty fuel. And that's what's creating it. It puts a lot of soot up there. The soot creates clouds. So artificial cloud creation from uh, Contrail Cirrus. This is what we like to call chemtrails on the internet. The problem is that if you Google the term chemtrails, you are going to get so many lies and deception, you will never, ever, ever be able to find out the truth. 
So I set out personally to debunk all of that and get to the nuts and butts of it. And at the end of the day, that's one E3 AWACS covering all of the UK by itself. This was during a 2008 volcano where they grounded all flights and the E3 was the only thing in the air. So without all the background uh, noise, they could actually see how bad the problem is. So for the chemtrailers who are going to be watching this presentation, I'd just like to throw you a little bone. Barium and aluminum is in the jet fuel. It was put in there in 1962. It's called Status 450 Denza. Um, it's an anti-static agent. They said that F4 Phantoms were exploding when small, far, uh, small arms fire were hitting their gasoline tanks. So the, the static was uh, basically blowing them up. Similarly, in the commercial aviation, they would go to refuel a plane. A static would jump from the hose to the plane and blow it up. So they put barium in there. Barium's poisonous. I don't like it. But you, if you don't know the whole history, then you're not well educated on this. At the bottom, you can see JP8 fuel has 9,300 parts per billion of aluminum in it. No additives, no, just that's it's kerosene. This chart here is showing the NATO fuel, um, what's called the NATO single fuel concept. NATO from 1988 to 1996 converted all of their planes and all of their nations from gasoline based fuel to diesel fuel. My stepfather was chief, chief master sergeant in the Air Force for 30 years. He worked on the E3 AWACS. He said that when this happened, they pretty much destroyed every fuel filter they had. They had black belch, which they haven't seen since 70 when it was banned the last time. That they had a lot of soot production problems. Soot is the number one cloud seed coming out of planes that makes all these clouds we see. So incomplete burn is leading to this. So let's get real about chemtrails because credibility is crucial. Chemtrails, persistent contrails, spreading contrails, contrail series, I could go on all day. I like to call them artificial clouds. But that's the actual terminology used by the individuals who study this phenomenon. So at this point, it's not even argumentative. Chuck Long from CRES, is the Earth System Research Lab Global Monitoring Division, said that we are accidentally geoengineering our planet with contrail generated haze of ice, which is subvisual. It's basically whitening our, our skies. Now, some of you may recall dark, deep blue skies. I remember it when I was a Boy Scout. I was in the woods every day. I remember it was so dark. It was amazing. We no longer have that. So for people to joke about chemtrails online and not take this seriously, they're actually hurting a very serious discussion for the, our time. None of these climate model jerks um, have ever accounted for aerosols properly. In fact, cloud aerosol interaction is the greatest unknown in climate science. It's not accounted for in any of their models. And when the IPCC tries to figure out what's doing what, if a linear contrail turns into a cirrus cloud, it is not accounted for or attributed to planes. It's just a cirrus cloud. So they, they claim that they can't tell the difference between nature and unnature, so we'll just call it nature. And for, as a result of that, the chart for cirrus clouds is this big. The chart for contrail cirrus is this big. You can add up CO2, methane, and the other. It's still not near as big as the cirrus clouds, which the planes are creating. So David Key said that if we were going to geoengineer the planet, we need 25,000 metric tons of sulfuric acid in the sky to do it. Forget about acid rain. I learned about that in high school. They don't talk about it anymore. Banned terminology. Don't say acid rain. Um, but that's what they want to do. So this guy, Oscar Escobar, he did a little bit of math, and he said, you know, well, they're already putting 20,000 metric tons of sulfuric acid up there in 1990. And the last estimate, you know, by 2010, it should have been up 110%. We're well over that. So he's saying, you know, why don't we end this unintended but failed and still ongoing experiment? And I fully agree with him. Because we are putting insane amounts of sulfuric acid up there. So I um, heard from a couple of my hacker buddies that there was a text file on an FTP server on the EPA website that said, we want to know if you think that these planes are affecting human health. If you do, would you like to have a hearing? I was the only person on the planet who said I'd like to. Lucy Audette from the EPA called me. She's a senior policy analyst. She tried to talk me out of coming. Of course, I recorded all that and put it on my YouTube channel, uh, <laughs> youtube.com slash Jim Lee Climate Viewer. You can, watch it. you can watch her beg me not to come. It's great. Um, but I went anyway, and I took five of my friends, and we went up there and talked about geoengineering, the new world order, and cloud creation. It was epic. 
So then they decided, in, uh, while the election cycle was going on, that they would limit greenhouse gases for the first time in history coming from planes. And I was there to tell them, I don't care about greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases never hurt anybody. I'm talking about acid rain and cloud creation because that hurts everybody. So they decided to, to limit greenhouse gases. Less than seven days later, Obama and his team comes out with the alternative jet fuel jet fuel research and development strategy. These are biofuels. They're mandated by George Bush in 2007, the U.S. Energy Independence Act of 2007. And uh, they, they said that they're going to basically push these biofuels on there as a solution to the chemtrail problem to get rid of these clouds because they produce much less soot. China, the U.S., Europe, and ICAO all agreed to regulate themselves. And then they threw my lawsuit out all during the election. So artificial cloud experimentation is a real thing now. This is uh, Ulrich Schumann from the German DLR saying less warming and more cooling contrails predictable for operational planning. Stratospheric sulfate injections from commercial air aircraft, I call it fuel sulfur content geoengineering. It is altering the sulfur content of jet fuel to get cooling clouds instead of heat trapping clouds. Ulrich Schumann also invented the contrail series simulation and prediction tool. And uh, there's the idea of spraying Pepto-Bismol from planes to melt their clouds away. It's called serious cloud seeding. Bismuth triad, I can't make this stuff up. So then we have the uh, Allen Robot got a call. This is one of the geoengineers I showed you earlier from the CIA saying, if someone was uh, controlling our climate, would we know about it? And he said, I think so. The problem with that, in 2015, January, at the 20th conference of planned and inadvertent weather modification, they have these conferences every two to three years, I'm going to the next one, um, Diane Seidel said, well, it depends on how bad the SRM was, the solar radiation management, and the duration, and if we had a sustained ob observing system, which we do not. And that's a serious problem. So I'm demanding verification and transparency. This is, what I, this is why I do what I do. I call it the clarity clause. And it's an addendum to NMOD because NMOD has no teeth. It's useless. We need a sustained observing system, a citizen-powered sensor network. I created Climate Viewer 3D for that purpose. I have gathered every single instrument that NASA, NOAA, and all of them have and put that live on my open source map. You can see all of this stuff in real time so you can monitor the atmosphere and hopefully catch somebody modifying the weather, because currently there is no way to do it. So I'm proposing that people buy sensors that they put in their backyard, that they are, have vetted, and we have connected to a decentralized, where's he at? Decentralized network, which is based on Node, um, for the techies out there, that we, we're programming. It's completely open source, and it'll be a citizen-powered verification system. Detect atmospheric conditions, have an all-sky camera so we can watch the video of it, and aerosol detection. Now, I understand this will be expensive and technology is not there yet, but we are rapidly getting to that point. And through, um, you know, all of us pushing for this sort of thing, and it, global demand will drive those prices down. We will have this. I'm going to make it a reality. <laughs> Um, so transparency, I want a, a multilateral registry of cloud seeding, geoengineering, and atmospheric experimentation events, and a 24-hour notice available on a website so that if somebody hurts you, if somebody modifies the weather and a flood destroys your property, just like with Hatfield back in the day, that you can prove your case in a court of law and do something about it, because currently there is no way to do that. And the only way to get this to be a reality is to demand it. So I really hope you guys will support me. Um, those are my three websites, climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org, and I'm going to be publishing weathermodificationhistory.com um, when I get back home, and it's going to have a lot of these timeline entries on it, and uh, gofundme.com slash climateviewer. If you guys want to help um, make this citizen-powered network a, a possibility, I'm trying to get some funding for that, but I believe that this is the way to go. When uh, Fukushima happened, they turned off RADNET. Rad net. When we had nuclear radiation coming across America, they cut off the only system that would have told us. That's unacceptable. I don't trust the government more than any, any more than any of you do. So that's why I, I think that it, the impetus should be on us to A, create the sensors, B, have the network, and demand the transparency so that we can put a stop to these practices. 
I think that a lot of people have been hurt over the years um, you know, by weather modification. I've read many cases of individuals who had cloud seeding done over their property and then had their property destroyed and then had it all blamed on God. And that's unacceptable. So that's why I'm here today and that's what I want you guys to know is there's been a hundred year history of people modifying the weather. We have no way to catch anybody doing it and it's time that we demand that that happen. And I hope that the system that I've designed, Climate Viewer 3D, can start to bring that about. And at the very least, it'll seed the idea that somebody else will take and then make this system a reality. Because I think that they have gotten away with this without any attention for far too long. So I guys, I really appreciate um, you letting me speak here today. And I hope that you guys will review this material. It will be available at um, climateviewer.com slash geoengineering. I'm going to publish this presentation. It has um, references on every slide in the notes section. So please download it and check it out. And thank you for having me. This is great. Jim, I want to thank you for giving the first succinct, documentable uh, dissertation on, climate, on geoengineering. I, we haven't had this yet, and it's about time. <laughs> <laughs>